Thank you. You can hear me all right? So yeah, I'm Steve Goldman. I am the observatory scientist for the SOFIA mission. And today I'm going to be talking about stellar evolution, um, a couple of different methods that we use, and then I'll also talk about our mission itself. So I'll do a, a brief review on my research. We focus on asymptotic giant branch stars. So the late stages of evolution for small and intermediate mass stars like the sun. I'll talk about something called a color magnitude diagram. I'll talk about their outflows, their mass loss, their dust production, and then the future prospects of my research. Okay. So talking about stars, you have to show something called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's the diagram here on the left, showing the different phases of evolution and where they lie. This is a useful tool that we use to understand stars. And then on the right, I'm showing something called a color magnitude diagram, showing all the stars from the Gaia mission, which was really helpful in our understanding of proper motions. But we care about these stars here, the cool ones that are very luminous. And this is a very convoluted diagram, but it's similar to an HR diagram, but showing how a star evolves over time from the main sequence to the red giant branch, horizontal branch, the AGB, the asymptotic giant branch, and then a post AGB in planetary nebula for a star like the sun and something more massive. So anyway, can everyone see this tiny little dot here? You can't really see it, but there's a tiny little blue ellipse in the center of that, um, that point there. Can anyone guess as to what that is supposed to represent? Any thoughts? The sun, anyone else? It's the size, the orbit of the earth around the sun. So that is an ALMA image of an AGB star, but it, it only shows a part of it. The full extent is much, much larger. So when you show different molecules like silicon oxide or aluminum, it's, it's much larger. Well, on my screen, you can't really see it here, but it, it's very large. So an asymptotic giant branch star, if you're plopped down next to it, this is what we think you would see. This is a simulation uh, sped up quite a bit. These stars are really complicated. They have these large convective cells. They pulsate over time scales of a couple hundred to a couple thousand days. They have changing chemistry. They produce a bunch of dust. They're really interesting and they have changes during our lifetimes that are significant. And there's two main chemical types that I wanna talk about. There are the oxygen rich and there are the carbon rich and they produce different types of molecules and dust. And what dictates this chemistry is the relative abundance of these two elements, because after a very stable molecule CO forms, whatever is left dictates that circumstellar chemistry. And so we think that for some of the earliest universe, um, the galaxies, the stars in those galaxies, they're mostly carbon rich, whereas our own galaxy, nearby galaxies like Andromeda, are primarily oxygen rich. So why do we care about this? These stars contribute a ton of material back to the universe. They are the dominant source of dust in the universe. That dust comes together to form planets, the sun, the solar system. So we wanna understand the origin of the material that makes us up. You need to understand this very brief phase of evolution. So for the, like I said, for our own galaxy, the metal rich, on the right, at most masses, these stars are oxygen rich, and for metal poor environments, they're mostly carbon rich. And we're astronomers, everything is a metal to us. If it's not hydrogen or helium, we call it a metal. So we refer to the metallicity as the amount of metals for some reason. These stars also pulsate. They're also known as Myra variables. This is the original OG Myra um, Omicron SETI, and um, you can see its pulsation period over many, many years. So they pulsate um, the fun, in the fundamental mode. So if you can think of a pulsation, that's, that's what we're talking about. And because this underlying mechanism is somewhat related to how bright the star is, they typically fall on these sequences. And we're interested in the one there. So depending on the underlying mechanism that's making these stars pulsate, they tend to scale with the luminosity of these stars. 
which is important not only to us, but also to cosmologists. I'll come back to that. And then also these stars have really crazy geometries. So this is some images from the Atacama Large Millimeter Array showing the different morphologies of these AGB stars. Here I'm showing each images, um, each of them has kind of a blue and red shifted um, tinge to it. So the red, it means that material is coming, um, moving away and blue is coming towards us. And when we're doing research on these stars, we, we model them and we always assume they're spherically symmetric. And that's, that's clearly not true. So we have a ways to go um, in doing that. And also you might care about these stars um, because the post-AGB phase after that uh, is over, it's a dominant source of ionizing flux. They produce a lot of elements, S-process elements, metals that are important for the universe or for us. And then also you can use them, even if you don't care about the stars, to do a lot of more interesting things um, in terms of galaxies. So I know that was a lot, <laughs> uh, but the big takeaways here are that these unique stars have a large impact on galaxies and that they're really hard to model for a number of different reasons. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about something called a color magnitude diagram. When we wanna understand these stars, one of the things that we typically do is we use images of say a nearby galaxy. And we'll do that in two different filters, say a V filter or an I filter. And what we do with that data is um, these filters, they probe different wavelengths, say it's blue or it's red. And so we take these different filters that probe these different wavelengths of these stars. Here's a couple of examples of the stars we care about. And you can see that for the oxygen rich AGB stars, there's a big difference in the two filters. And for this one, there's also a, a difference. So by taking two images, figuring out how bright each star is in, both, in, the, in the galaxy, we can quantify the difference in the two images for each star that you take a picture of. If you then use those numbers and plot them on a diagram here, you plot the difference on the x-axis and how bright a star is on the y-axis. So the x-axis is the color, the difference. Then they start to fall in kind of different areas because of their differences. And you can use the differences to kind of put them in different classification schemes. This is a really useful tool for classifying a whole galaxy of stars with just a couple images. You don't need fancy spectroscopy to, to really understand them. And you can't really do that for a lot of the more distant stars. This is a really helpful tool that we use to understand <clears throat> stars and stellar evolution. And then if you have multiple colors, you can have even more discretionary power. You can even model uh, this photometry, how bright each star is, and find out more about the underlying physics of these stars. So the big takeaways are that you can use this color magnitude diagram and the differences between images to learn a lot about these stars. And you can model the data to get even more information. Okay, now I'm gonna be talking about outflows and their mass loss. These stars will lose up to 80% of their mass in a really brief amount of time. Um, and they'll contribute a lot of that back to the universe, which then goes on to um, contribute to the regeneration of the universe. And one of the ways that we can probe these stars and their outflows is something called a maser. It's similar to a laser, but in the microwave. And these masers, they typically have two peaks. And these two peaks represent the blue shifted and red shifted emission from the material coming towards you and moving away on the near and far side of the star. So assuming a star is at the center of these two peaks, which is a fair assumption given the size of this maser shell, by measuring the speed or the redshift of material to each of the peaks, you can measure the wind of material moving out from a star that's very far away. This is a powerful technique that we have, but it only happens in these oxygen-rich AGB stars. The, mater, the strength of these changes over time and the profile might have multiple peaks. So I was a PhD student and I decided I wanna to try to do this um, using an Australia, Australian telescope for, for a big you know, bright red supergiant. And it'll be great and I'll, I'll measure the wind speeds. And this is what, 
this is what it showed up. So it's supposed to have two peaks, but clearly it does not. So it was a little disheartening, but also really cool. Uh, I talked to some experts, you know, folks who read, wrote books on masers. I asked them like, what is going on here? And they're like, beats me, I have no idea. So we think it might have some crazy geometry, a torus. We really don't know. If you have any ideas, please let me know. So we use these masers. We can also use something called CO line emission. It's a thermal line emission. It's not as bright, but you can do it with a couple of nearby sources like these. You can do it in both car carbon and oxygen rich stars. You can also measure the mass loss, but they're not very bright. So we haven't really detected many. And it's sensitive to a number of different things. So I did this using the James Clerk Maxwell telescope not too long ago. Got to travel to Hawaii, go up to the top of Mauna Kea and observe. Um, and so after I, I traveled to Mauna Kea and adjusted to the time zone, and then you have to, again, adjust to the night shift. And then you go up to the mountain where you have about 60% the oxygen that you typically have and you do the observing. Um, and so when I was up there somewhat delirious, this, this guy, Jim, who was an operator started telling me this story of how they constructed the James Clerk Maxwell telescope. And if you didn't know, it had a bit of a hiccup. So when they were creating the telescope, they manufactured most of the parts in England and they wanted to ship it over. And the captain that they had, um, he couldn't do it for some reason. He had some malfunctions with ship. So they hired some third party guy and, and he took the material and he started on his way. And that's when they realized they were gonna have a problem because he wasn't showing up where he was supposed to, wasn't answering calls. And so he uh, pops up in Amsterdam and they're like, what? Uh, and yeah, he picked up some more material. He's gonna bring down uh, two birds, one stone, make some more money. And so they're like, okay, fine, whatever. And he finally makes his way down to the Panama Canal and they won't let him through. Mostly because the thing he picked up in Amsterdam was explosives. Um, so he got stuck off the coast of uh, the Panama Canal for a while. They finally moseyed his way through. And then he showed up and they're like, bro, you're way late. There's a ton of charges that we're gonna charge you with. You're not gonna make any money on this venture. And he says, if you don't pay me in full, I will dump the telescope in the ocean. And so they're like, oh crap, okay, what do we do? Um, they contacted the Coast Guard, they, they got a court order and the, the, the law that they were using was the law governing the high, high piracy on, on the high seas. And so the Coast Guard went in, guns out, and they, they took him in. And as is maritime tradition, they, they nailed the court order to the mast of the ship. And they, they got the telescope where it's supposed to be. But given my state, I thought he was messing with me, but it's a true story. Um, <laughs> and because of this, they recently transported the James Webb Space Telescope in secret. It was cloaked in secrecy. I was at the Space Telescope Science Institute, the Missions Operations Command Center at the time, and no one knew until it arrived in French Guiana where it was being launched out of. So this is, this is an issue. But anyways, um, CO line emission, it's a really useful tool. And we tried to do this in the nearby galaxies that you may be familiar with, the Magellanic Clouds. And these represent slightly earlier galaxies. So similar to an earlier universe. So we can see how these stars differ in, across cosmic time. And uh, long story short, the, the two different chemical types showed differences. Um, the oxygen rich stars showed slower winds in more metallophore environments, which has large implications for how these stars contribute in the early universe and our understanding of, of where material has come from. So it, it was uh, fairly useful. Um, I think it was a good conclusion. The main takeaways are that there's few measurements, but the ones that we have have um, shown there is an impact on this metallicity for these outflows. Okay, moving right along, I do wanna talk about dust. It sounds super boring. Uh, my dad always told me that you need to rebrand it, make it a little sexier, but no, it's, it's dust. Um, <laughs> but the formation of this dust is kind of cool because they figured out that you can't really make this dust just from stars blowing off material and making dust. It's not enough. So you need some kind of mechanism. So what we think happens is that as these stars pulsate, they levitate material out to large radii. That material then cools, condenses into dust grains. And the dust grains, like tiny little solar sails, they move outwards from the radiation pressure, from light. Light pushes them outwards and they drag along gas through friction. 
So through this dust-driven wind, they think these stars, this is how they lose a lot of mass. So uh, Susan Hoffer kind of refers to this as like a two-stage rocket, where the first stage is the pulsation, second stage is radiation pressure. The problem is we can't really balance the physics to make it actually work, but we know that this is the most likely scenario. We just need to find that balance, but it's very hard to make. Still a lot of questions for these stars. This is an AGB star, uh, direct image. We don't know what the composition of the dust is, how long it survives, if you need some kind of start to create dust around it, a uh, seed nucleus, or if it's affected by metallicity. If you don't have a seed, can you even make the dust? A lot of questions that we still have. And the problem, I showed this diagram before, most of our data is right there. So we can hope, we can assume, we can extrapolate, but we really need data on this side and on that side, the metal rich side and the metal poor side. And so that's been some of my work recently. So in the metal poor regime, remember I showed a, a color magnitude diagram before? And it's great, you can identify these evolved stars pretty easily using this color magnitude diagram. Down here at the bottom, you have a lot of like garbage that we throw away. It's background galaxies or you know, smaller, younger stars. But for more distant galaxies, the stars that we want to look at become fainter, but the background galaxies stay the same. So we can't really use this method for more distant galaxies. So we need to use something else. So one of the things that we use is pulsation. Like I said, these stars pulsate. Really large pulsations, they change brightness quite dramatically, orders of magnitude. And so what we did is we used a bunch of data from the Spitzer Space Telescope and infrared telescope to try to look for pulsating stars, changing stars. And so we did that for a number of stars in, in nearby metal core galaxies, uh, like this one here. Oh, that didn't come through. Um, there we go. One of the things that we used, long story short, is you can use these as a distance indicator to see how far away things are because it the, the pulsation period is directly proportional to how bright it is. So not only us, but a lot of cosmologists care about this. Nobel laureates, Adam Reese, I talked to him recently about using this method. Uh, Wendy Friedman, another very prominent astrophysicist trying to constrain the Hubble constant, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. This is important for them, and we found that this works in most nearby environments. So, these here. We also try to find, really push the envelope and see if we can find, in the most ancient nearby galaxies, if we can find these stars. And we, we found a couple, small number, we need some more. But a couple of weeks ago, I was awarded um, 30 more orbits in the Hubble Space Telescope to look at an even more metal poor galaxy with a couple more stars. So hopefully next year, we're going to find more of them. But the takeaway is that they, they seem to be producing dust in these environments that are similar to the most high redshift galaxies that we see dust. So over time, I've slowly moved to more metal poor environments, but I decided it was time to Look at our own galaxy, some, something similar to home. And one of the things you can do is you can look at stars like those in the Milky Way. Um, pros, they're nearby. You can observe them pretty quickly. You don't need uh, huge telescopes. But the problem is you can't get accurate distances to a lot of these. And that's a problem because you can't really estimate the true brightness of a star when you don't know how far it is. It's like someone standing in a field with a flashlight versus a car much farther away showing their headlights. So you need to know the distance fairly well to really understand these stars. And with a, a telescope called Gaia, we can use that to estimate using parallax how far away a star is. But where the brightness, the peak brightness is on these stars moves around. So that screws up parallactic measurements. You can't do that. Also, the filters are in the optical and the stars we're looking at are obscured in the optical. They're very dusty. So you can only see them in the infrared. So we go to Andromeda um, or M31. It's a nearby galaxy that you might uh, know. We used a bunch of archival data that's already available. Telescopes love Andromeda. There's a large sample. It is a known distance that's relatively uncontroversial, but it is more distant. So this is the panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury survey. 
This is one of the largest mosaic images that Hubble ever made, one of the most detailed images. And when you zoom in to any given spot, each one of those is a star with potential planets around it. This survey identified 120 million individual sources. And there's another telescope called the Roman, which we able to do this in days, as opposed to Hubble, which took months. So we used this data and it decided, hey, I'm gonna find all the AGB stars in this catalog. <laughs> So we use this data as well as data from the Spitzer Space Telescope to try to do this project. It took several years and I didn't do it by hand. That would be impossible. We had a great team of people um, from around the world working on this. And before I show you the results, I do wanna say it's, it's pretty cool studying Andromeda with a telescope called Hubble. Because if you don't know, Edwin Hubble about a hundred years ago used variable stars to determine that Andromeda was much farther than we previously thought, way farther. It meant that Andromeda had to be its own island universe, which was a pretty exciting prospect at that time. Every, most people thought that the Milky Way was all there was at the time. So it's really exciting to be working on Andromeda, looking at variable stars with a telescope named Hubble, but also you have to mention Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She did most of the groundwork for determining this, for discovering this method of identifying distances using these variable stars and didn't get any credit at the time. So we credit her now. Um, she discovered the Levitt law. Henrietta Swan Levitt. Now we know. So this is, each of these is an AGB star that we detected. We detected over 350,000 of them, much larger than any previous sample of these stars. And we can finally compare them to other nearby galaxies where we do have good data. We also have little pockets where we can determine the chemistry, either carbon or oxygen rich, using color color diagrams showing differences in the spectra. And so going back to this diagram, one of the things that kind of pops out of this analysis is that when you look at just how bright the AGB stars are and compare it to the other two galaxies where we have data, going from the most metal poor, more metal rich, more metal rich, you can see a shrinking of how bright the stars are representative of their masses. This is the first time we saw this. So it was a good confirmation of what we thought. And I'm also gonna show our oxygen rich sample to show it wasn't just an observational bias, it's the same data. One of the other cool things that came out of this is that if you just look at where the stars are, don't even care about the stars, you care about galaxies, that's cool too. As you move from the brightest stars or the youngest ones shown up there, most massive, younger, and you move to the least massive, you can see that the top there, most of them are kind of around this, this ring that we see that we think that most of the stars are forming. So what we think is happening is we're watching the migration of stars over time, essentially, by looking at the most massive and the least massive. And it's really hard to see stars migrate because this takes billions of years. But just looking at this data, this is what we think this represents. Also, we can look at where the stars are producing dust to see where that dust is coming from and where it's going. And also compare it to other stars to see, um, using this as a method to just see features. If you compare the AGB to red giant branch stars, the, the feature just pops out. So even if you don't care about these stars, you can use them as galaxy probes. And then we also have detected clusters where we have precise measurements of mass and, and how many metals there are. And we can use it to calibrate stellar evolutionary models where these boundaries are relatively unknown. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, the big things to take away here are that we have this huge new sample. Um, it's fantastic, bunch of stars producing dust. We can compare them to the only other galaxies that we have. We can look at the spatial distribution to, learn, to use that as a galaxy probe. And we also estimated how much um, these stars contribute to the dust that we see in Andromeda between one and 35%. That's a huge range, but it is much better than the previous ranges, which were between 0.1 and 100% of all the dust. So we're making headway. Okay, so now I'll talk about the future, future prospects of this. Um, this is a CMD I'm showing again, but showing a bunch of stars, AGB stars that are bright in the ultraviolet. 
Now that's not usual for these really dusty, reddened, obscured stars. So what's going on? Why are they bright in the ultraviolet? Well, we think these are, whoops. Well, we think they're symbiotic systems. There was an animation, but it's not showing. It's something showing. <laughs> um, there we go, okay. Uh, it's essentially an AGB star being accreted onto a younger hot white dwarf. So it's a binary system. And that's kind of how I got into SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. We wanted to use SOFIA and the Hubble Space Telescope to look at these stars that are bright in the ultraviolet and the infrared. So briefly about SOFIA, I do work for SOFIA. Um, SOFIA is this Boeing 747 with uh, a big door in the back and we plopped a two and a half meter telescope there. It's uh, an airborne observatory that can fly up to 45,000 feet, close to 14 kilometers high. And the reason why we do that is because all of our instruments are all, sorry, infrared instruments. And if you wanna observe in the infrared, here I'm showing how much light gets through our own atmosphere. In the visible, it's most. And the UV, it's not much. And in the near infrared, mid infrared, and far infrared, it's kind of patchy. So we fly above most of the atmosphere to get a better reception, essentially. Also, if we want to detect things like water, you are going to detect the water in the atmosphere unless you get above it. So Sophia um, flies in these crazy patterns. This is the last time we were down here. We flew all these different paths. Um, and the reason why we do that is one, because the door is only on one side. And so you have to angle the door and the telescope where you want to look at the certain time, given the season and the weather patterns and air traffic and turbulence. So it's tremendously complex trying to schedule things for this observatory. This is what we did last night. Um, we used uh, our German instrument, great. We did some spectroscopy. I think we observed Saturn. If you wanna look at what Sophia is looking at at a, any given moment, you can go to FlightAware and put in NASA 747 and you can figure out what it's doing. Um, I have had the opportunity to fly on Sophia a couple different times. And Sophia has a first class cabin um, up left and then the flight deck, the flight engineer with all of their buttons and then the main deck with all of our different computers and where the mission director sits, where the observers sit um, and the operators. And it's really cool to be standing in the middle of all this and having five different teams working perfectly in unison, very skilled teams. Each one has to do their job correctly just to get uh, some photons to hit our detector and it, and it usually works. Here I'm showing, you can kind of see some movement of the telescope assembly. It's massive. It's, I think it's 17 tons and it's perfectly balanced in this, between this cavity. So on one side, it's not pressurized and the other, it is, that's where the people are. And because it's perfectly balanced, you can go up to it and just move it, move it around with your hand. And so we, this is, XE is one of the instruments. And sometimes we'll get turbulence during these flights and you'll see the telescope kind of jiggle. And then you realize, no, 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 no. It's the, it's the airplane jiggling around the telescope because it's so perfectly still. So the way I got involved with Sophia is I applied for time on Sophia and they let us look at one of these nearbiotic symbiotic systems um, with Hubble and Sophia. And with Hubble, we're, we're seeing some strange changes that I'm working with a couple interns and trying to decipher. Again, we're still a little unsure as to what's happening in the system, but um, there's a lot of material that's being spewed out and, and we wanna to try to quantify how much has been spewed. And then with Sophia, we wanna understand the dust um, and, and what's happening with that as well. So there's a very complicated system that you need a lot of different observations to understand. So even if you don't really care about AGB stars, if you're just interested in Sophia or the infrared, we do have an archive that you can, anyone can, can view. Uh, most of the data are publicly available. You can download it right now. You could download my own data and uh, scoop me. It's not published yet. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as you may know, Sophia is sadly ending. 
um, after October 1st, we will not be doing any more observations. Um, this was a decision that came down from the top from NASA, but with the loss of Sophia, we're gonna lose a lot of, of capability. So this is an image of the uh, center of a galaxy with Hubble. And you can glean some information just from the image itself. But when you add Sophia, it tells a different story. We can use the magnetic fields to see how material is being funneled into the center. And we won't be able to do these kind of polarization measurements, magnetic field work um, very much at all for at least the next 10 years with the loss of Hawk Plus, one of our instruments. We can do some balloon missions, but there isn't any observatory like Sophia. You can also learn about the magnetic fields around galaxies, uh, collimation of material, jets. Recently, we detected water on the sunlit side of the moon. You might have heard of that in the news. And um, that's not just exciting to us, but to NASA itself. We do want to go back to the moon with the Artemis program. And maybe someday we'll be using that water to create rocket propellant. Yep. Beaming the power. I don't know. Possibly, yeah. The original concept for the James Webb Space Telescope was going to be moon based. It was called the Next Generation Telescope. We decided that was a bad idea. But I was perusing the library at the Space Telescope Science Institute and it showed the diagrams of the original design. It was horrible. Anyways, um, one of the things you can do with SOFIA is detect these molecules that you can't detect with any other observatory. Um, this is the methylidine radical that you find in the ISM. You can learn a lot about the chemistry that happens in the between stars. So my time is about up, um, but some of the main takeaways I want you to kind of have are that AGB stars are this important phase of evolution that most stars will go through, including the sun. Um, they're very complica complicated and they have a large contribution back to the universe. Um, and we, we, with upcoming uh, telescopes like James Webb, um, we're gonna learn a lot more. I think there's gonna be a big release of James Webb Space Telescope images in a couple of days. Um, I got an email today that the president is gonna announce the president of the United States is going to talk about Sophia, um, I think, tomorrow. So it's a perfect telescope to observe AGB stars with, and we're really excited for observatories like James Webb. So with that, thank you so much for listening and, and for inviting me, and I'll take your questions. Yes. Last night we looked at, I think, are you saying on Sophia? There are a number of things we, we care about um, from the Magellanic like clouds um, to uh, other nearby Southern targets. I mean, it's the only observatory that we have in both the Northern and Southern hemisphere. And if you wanna observe things in the Southern hemisphere, with a telescope that's in the Northern Hemisphere, it's not very easy and sometimes impossible. Yes. Um, so by no means are they uh, repetitive. Sophia, James Webb can't observe a lot of the targets that Sophia can because they're too bright. Also, James Webb doesn't have high spectral resolution uh, spectroscopy. It doesn't have uh, polarization. They were going to be great friends for the next, you know, a couple of years. You could do a bunch of observations with both observatories, but um, the budgeting, uh, they, they said that it was mostly due to cost and inefficiency of the observatory. Um, and it's unclear where that funding is going to go. A lot of people think, hey, it's going to go back to some other infrared mission, but that's not necessarily true. It could go to heliophysics or some other branch. Well, the other thing that intrigued me is that the 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the star that we're studying, um, the symbiotic system, in 1975, it got six magnitudes brighter all of a sudden, a nova like outburst. That's a lot. And unlike most novae, it stayed bright for a very long amount of time. So it became really interesting in 1975, and then people kind of lost interest, and we decided, hey, it's a good time to check it again. But yeah, these stars are really interesting because they change over our lifetimes, which is not true of most stars. Yes. Yes, there it is. You can go to the Sophia archive, or you can just go to the Sophia website, and we're very proud of all of our images. And so there's plenty of there. Yeah. Henrietta Swan Levitt. Yes. She used Cepheid variables as a measure to determine distance, similar to like the pulsation period luminosity relation that I've, I've been using. Yeah. Yep. A lot um, for a number of reasons. The, the previous telescope that was kind of comparable to Spitzer and it's much, much smaller. So with James Webb, which is the perfect instrument for AGB studies, don't tell Sophia, but um, it's from learning about the dust that we really don't know about to studying distant galaxies that weren't an option before. Uh, we're gonna learn a lot about this phase of evolution. Yes. Um, do you have the message? <laughs> do you know how to? Well, I know how to mess around. <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah, if someone else can find that question while we answer another question. <laughs> Ooh, what is dust? And there are fights about this. Um, so anything from, so it's typically like pyroxenes and olivine, silicate rich dust, and it's anything from a micron per mile. So you're looking through a dust cloud and you would never know at the time because there are these tiny little particles spread so far apart, but from large scales, it does look like a cloud of dust. So we think the dust is between like a micron, a micrometer and maybe a hundred microns. Larger, that's, that's a rock. <laughs> Small rocks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Another good question. Um, so the instruments, some of them could be used on ground-based observatories. Others that wouldn't work, impossible. So we are exploring that option. For uh, Hubble, the, um, the things that could fail are the gyros. So it's the things that are able to position the satellite towards the things we want. So those have been failing over the last couple of years. If another one fails, it'll limit our ability to point the telescope. So this happened to another mission, the Kepler mission. So they had to kind of adjust, you know, just look at all the things that it's, it can see while it's orbiting. So it will likely continue for a number of years. It could continue for you know, 10 more years, but it'll depend on what fails first. It was only supposed to last, I think, 10 years, if that, and it's older than me. So any other questions? <laughs> yes, way in the back. Yes, I don't want to ask any questions, but this one's uh, important. Um, basically, it's a long story, but I don't know what it was called, but Matt had a flying observatory back in the day, um, which had to be seen on the observatory from it. The Kuiper. The Kuiper Airborne Observatory. I'm not sure if 
Yeah, it's a bit smaller than Sophia, but similar idea. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know who the person to talk to is, but I'll put you in contact with um, the, the NASA, my NASA counterpart with um, the outreach team. Yeah. Okay. We can talk after. Any other questions about Sophia, James Webb, Hubble, astronomy, stars? Yes. Sophia mentioned before about um, James Webb, and actually being planned to be on the moon. And then you see what a terrible idea it was. Can you elaborate some of that? Because it's kind of Yeah, I don't remember the exact reasoning why we originally wanted to do it on the moon, but I think there were different considerations from getting it there to temperatures. All the instruments on James Webb need to be extremely cold. And I think maybe the moon wasn't useful for that. That's not good. Yeah, we don't want that. <laughs> so I think there was a number of considerations, but that was thrown out pretty early. Yes. There is no current plans. Um, it, it seems that it just, in terms of cost effectiveness, satellites are more efficient, but you do lose the capability of trying new instruments out. You only got one shot for James Webb. <clears throat> and for Sophia, you can we switch out instruments every couple of days, so you can try a new one, see if it works. Um, so yeah, it's a useful observatory, but there's no other plans successor. No, we could keep on going for another ten years. Uh, we've kind of reached our stride in terms of observations. We originally we started doing observations in 2010. It took us some some years to to kind of hit our stride, but we're at it, and sadly we're, we're losing funding. Yes. I we I think there is a little bit of of a buffer. Um, we can only do I think like a twenty degree bank for any turn for the aircraft. Uh, but the, the pilots do a remarkable job of getting us exactly um, where we want to be. They're very skilled. <laughs> and they have a number of great stories, and, and it's always fun being up there. Yeah. So they have a 20% stake. They pay for 20% of the cost. They also provided the telescope itself. Um, and it's unclear what the future of Sophia will be. We've looked into other governments, other agencies to pick up the slack, um, but it doesn't look like anyone's going to do it. Um, so, yeah, even what will happen with Sophia itself, you know, Germany uh, owns the telescope. Where is Sophia going to go in the end? Um, in a museum? Back to Germany? We, people have different opinions. Yeah. Uh, I've always wondered why there is a propeller space on the international space station. And I keep it because of thermal radiation and tide leaking. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. Um, they do have like cameras, but there isn't really a telescope uh, specifically. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know why. As, as you may know, Hubble was visited by astronauts a no, number of times. Um, and so we, we could have some kind of platform up there for them to hang out with, but we don't. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't, I don't know about it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> well, Google it. <laughs> I have a, a oh right yes the online Sergey actually Sergey okay great hi Sergey so first he wanted to thank you for a great lecture uh, and then he asked for more information about the observations of OH masers in Australia like which telescopes did you use the uh, Australia Telescope Compact Array um, a couple of years back yeah. if he wants to get the data I have it on my hard drive so yeah. <laughs> let me know. 
So if there's no other questions, I do have NASA stickers for everyone if they want want, want them. So. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you very much.